Hey there, welcome to another episode of Chop Shop. Chopper here, and on the chopping block today, we have the inimitable Tarek Ergen. And this guy, you may know him as a lacrosse player, you may know him as an actor, you may know him as an animal whisperer. We're gonna get at all three of those when we uh, we chat here today. First of all, Tarek, welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Drew. I'm going to have to look up inimitable. Is that an insult or a compliment? You know what? It's right <laughs> down the middle. And in fact, it just came to me. I, I probably may not even applied it correctly. But uh, <laughs> all right, so look, here's the deal. Um, you know, this is a show that's based on lacrosse, life lessons, all of that. But before we even get going, if someone were to Google you and came up with your Wikipedia page, here's what it says, because I, I want to use this as sort of the, uh, the jumping off point. Um, Ergen was born in Hingham, Mass, Turkish descent. He played the part of Lieutenant Junior Grade Ayala in Star Trek Voyager, as well as Satan's Robot from the Captain Proton holodeck program and Lieutenant Chorus Sprint in the Star Trek Borg computer game. Now, I know I a lot of people, that. myself included, <laughs> that would kill to do any one of those things. So uh, we're going to want to talk about that. Um, we're wanting to talk about the fact that one at one point you were credited as Ayala, at another point just as security guard in Fury. So there sounds like that might be some real controversy as far as your credits go. And uh, <laughs> also minor roles in episodes of Red Shoe Diaries, which we at least want to touch on a little bit. Now, lifelong <laughs> lacrosse player, it does give you credit for that. Professional player and coach with Hollywood Lacrosse, want to talk about that. And currently, the uh, the uh, coach of the Oak Park High School boys varsity lacrosse team. So a lot of ground to cover. And um, let's just start with sort of your your beginning. You know, how did you you know coming out of high school? Were you an actor? Were you a class, lacrosse player? Were you both? Uh, get us caught up. Okay, it, 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 the two kind of evolved together simultaneously. I was uh, always doing from elementary school on. I was doing school plays. Um, I didn't discover lacrosse till I was maybe in the sixth grade and my sister's boyfriend was playing at the, the, the high school varsity lacrosse team. Never heard of it. He gave me a broken wooden stick. I played in the backyard by myself, learned how to scoop, throw. It, it was literally zero pocket. And, <laughs> and I learned how to do, I taught myself how to throw and catch. And he helped me a little bit from time to time with mechanics. And then when uh, I was, I could play on a team, I was like one of three people that could actually throw and catch on the first day. So I got to start. And, uh, but I, I always, I, I did not like sports until I was about 10 years old, uh, watching, playing, any of that. Um, I started swimming competitively as an eight year old and losing every race. And, you know, I hated that. My dad suggested joining the AAU, swimming year round. The next summer, I won every race. And uh, so I kind of learned, the, you know, if you want to get good at something, you got to put in the time. And uh, so anyway, then I did plays throughout high school and um, didn't really know what I was doing, but uh, I had a presence or something. I don't know. And, didn't, and could remember my lines. And, uh, and I played sports and lacrosse, football and swimming were the three I did in, in high school. And then um, college, I took a hiatus from acting because between the academic uh, regimen and the athletic regimen, there just weren't enough hours in the day. You could, can't spread yourself too thin, which is kind of a lesson that uh, you know, I have to teach a lot of our kids that we coach today. You know, they, they have their fingers in everything, which means you can't become great at any one thing. So. Okay, so, uh, so you, you kind of, you know, you mentioned you were acting in plays and stuff. What was the initial interest in acting? And can you remember the first thing you ever acted in? Oh, gosh. I know I remember the one of the first things I did in, was it elementary school? Well, I wanted to play the lead and didn't get the part. And I played something. I can't remember what the production was. I remember in high school, I did Enter Pharaoh Nussbaum. 
uh, which was a comedic, you know, sort of a spoof on on the, the old 50s detective, you know, where they, you'd show up at a mansion on a foggy night and and somebody gets killed type of thing. Um, what else did we do? I honestly don't remember yeah, too well, many of the plays. What got you interested to begin with? I mean, uh, I mean, did somebody put you in something and you enjoyed it? Or did you used to watch TV and say, I want to do that? Well, I, I probably am an attention whore. <laughs> so, <laughs> sports, you know, whatever, there's an audience. That's where I wanted to be, yeah. which is odd because I remember being terrified when I was first up on stage, yeah. either, you know, in elementary school, middle school, I, it, it was a level of terror. Uh, I know when I got to Cornell um, and was suited up for my first varsity game as a freshman, I am so glad that I played a to grand total of one second in that game before the whistle blew for halftime. And my coach was smart because if somebody had, if the ball had found me, it would have been embarrassing because I was so nervous. I couldn't feel my hands, my arms, my stick, nothing. I, I was very nervous. And did, uh, did you get nervous like that when you were acting? Before the play, yes. It was, it was a very uncomfortable feeling. And swimming races were the same thing. You know, before that gun went off, I was uh, a bundle of nerves. And uh, lacrosse games, too, because I was a face-off guy. So I was the first player involved in every game. And uh, I always hated the first face-off. Always. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's kind of like you're shy and you're an attention whore at the same time. That's not a, it's not. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny. You said you Googled me and Wikipedia. Came. I, I was like, I have ne never Googled myself. Oh, they, you know, for identity theft alone, they say you're always supposed to do that. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but it, it, you know, I mean, um, I, I brought up the acting thing, too, because, I mean, current days, you know, you're, you're here you are in Southern California as a very prominent high school lacrosse coach. I'll bet you got kids that playing for you that wouldn't have known you're an actor. And by the way, come Monday, they're going to be teasing the heck out of you. And I'm sure you're ready for that. So, Tark, let's get after that acting thing a little bit. So, so okay. we get through college, you know, Cornell lacrosse. Which were you doing coming out of college or were you balancing the two? But to tell me about the, you know, the first five years out of college, what were you doing and how did you balance it? Well, the first year out of college, I uh, managed to get a job at the U.S. Department of Commerce. And I went down to Washington, D.C. Believe it or not, there was zero lacrosse within, I would have had to drive to College Park or Baltimore if I wanted to play. So I was done playing lacrosse. Um, and I was only down there for about eight months because I worked in the, the, uh, oh, what do they call it? Um, this, the legal department of the, of the, uh, cause I was going to go to law school. So over the department of commerce. So anyway, I, um, I got bored. The lawyers, that's not, that's not a, an exciting, it's not exciting. It's not Perry Mason. You're not in court <laughs> all the time. <laughs> and uh, so I just, I had deferred law school admission. So I didn't go to law school. And then I moved back to Boston. I started working in a moving company with a couple of buddies of mine from college. Uh, started, this, they started this business. I came in, I did that for a few years that, you know, working with buddies in a, in a company doesn't always work out. Next thing I know, but I started playing lacrosse again and taking acting classes while I was in Boston. And then uh, I, I got bought out and I uh, bartended for a while. I worked at a health club. I was a fitness trainer um, thing, you know, and I juggled all that, played lacrosse, took acting classes and you know, did the occasional play in, in the surrounding area of Boston, that type of thing. Um, after that, I realized I, I was getting paid a lot of money bartending. And I knew I was not going to quit that job unless I left town. So I and went to, back to school. So I came out to California because I was either going to move to New York and try acting or California uh never been a big fan of manhattan uh just it's too claustrophobic for me i guess would be a way to put it 
So I went to California I, and to sell it to my parents, I, I got into Pepperdine Business School. I went to business school for two years. Uh, back then, I, because I was bartending, I had long hair then as well. And I, you know, second year, second semester, everybody cut their hair, wore their suits to school every day because they had job interviews. I didn't have a single job interview. I wanted to graduate, get an agent, and start and start acting. For, and, and while I was in business school, I was taking acting classes in in Southern California. Um, well, I, I got to jump you here one time because you said something that perked my ears. You said you made a lot of money bartending. That, that's yeah. not usually the story that bartenders tell. So, what's the key to making a lot of money when you're bartending? Be a bartender in 19, in the 1980s. Okay, so I mean, <laughs> meaning that it, you were that busy, or because it, the bartender was the demand was busiest nightclub in Boston. Okay, well then, uh, right, right uh, behind the Green Monster at Fenway Park. Oh my! So, but it, all right, we're going to get off of this. But any great stories from when you were a bartender? You know? Oh my God! Like we, we got how many how many episodes are we going to do? We got time for one <laughs> anecdote, so make it your best. Um. Well, I almost got into a fight with Prince's manager. Does that oh, count? <laughs> I, I think you would have been better off picking on Prince because he was like five feet tall, right? I mean, well, Prince's manager wasn't much bigger. Okay. We were performing at the club and uh, I didn't want to bartend because on that night. So I was basically working security with, uh, you know, because of one of the guys I worked with who was a manager of the concerts, uh, he, you know, he said, well, you can be my front face for security. So I had a suit on and everything and I had to get there early and we had a back entrance and this guy comes walking in, it was a couple of guys and I didn't know any of them. And I just wanted to find out who they were. Now I should have, having seen Purple Rain, I should have recognized him, but I didn't. Um, it was Maurice, uh, I think, or Morris, what I think was his name in the movie. Yeah. And, and I, I just wanted some proof of who they were. And he didn't like that I didn't recognize him, I guess, because he felt like he was beyond uh, reproach or, and uh, so he got very upset and uh, it, it wasn't good, but fortunately, my friend, the manager, had, had stepped in at this point. He smoothed things out, and uh, I stayed away from that guy for the rest of the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, you know, you're, you're going to act. You can go to New York or, or California. I would have picked California, saying, uh, although I didn't become an actor, I was dying to get out here as well. So get us out here. How did you get... How did you work your way into a Star Trek role and balance that with lacrosse? Oh, uh, after regret after uh, graduate uh, business school graduation, uh, one of the I was I'd been coaching at Pepperdine for the lacrosse team because back then I was younger and I was running around campus. Saw some kids playing lacrosse on the on the field there with the track around it, so I stopped to watch. One of the kids runs up to me. He goes, uh, "Do you play?" And I said, "Yeah." And he goes, "You want to play for us?" And I said, well, I imagine I don't have any eligibility. <laughs> <laughs> and he asked, and then I told him I played four years at Cornell. And he goes, you want to coach? <laughs> <laughs> so suddenly I'm coaching the Pepperdine lacrosse team. One of the other coaches lived in Malibu and he had, he was from Long Island originally. And he had, he was working as a manager at a deli up in Malibu. I don't believe it's there anymore. It's right where Canaan comes out onto PCH. And uh, so after, you know, it was about a week or two after graduation and I drove up there to have lunch and I was sitting at the counter and I, I was reading Les Miserables, which was, you know, it was a book about that thick at that time. And I looked to my right and there's a guy reading Les Miserables. The same copy, same edition of the paperback one that I had. And we started talking about Les Miserables. Well, that was Jonathan Banks, the actor. And I told, you know, in the course of an hour and a half that we had lunch together, uh, he was a very, very ingratiating, generous man. Um, I guess he liked me and wanted to help me out. And he introduced me to his 
former agent when he was, you know, he was a little too big for a boutique agency at that time, but his first agent that he was with for 20 years. Um, so he, he get, cut, let up, he basically got us together. I met with the agent, signed with the agent, and then I started going on auditions. Uh, and he was, he was a terrific agent. He was said, he, unfortunately he passed away a couple of years later. Um, but, uh, also, you know, you want to get your SAG card. So what do most act, you know, actors, people want to get into the business, what do they do? They start doing extra work. And hopefully you can get your SAG card that way. If you get three SAG vouchers as an extra, you're eligible to join SAG. If you are, but it's hard to get those vouchers. So I got two like that. And I was, and then a year goes by and nothing. And then finally, I had auditioned for this movie. I think it was called Improper Conduct. And I got the part. I was playing Donald, the maitre d' at the, at the restaurant. I did a scene with Nia Peoples. And uh, I got taft Hartley into SAG that way. So I never did get my third SAG voucher. Um, but, uh, and then uh, through the extra agency, Central Casting, they had sent me on a star on a Star Trek. Uh, I will call it an audition, but it's really just a look see. You know, they want to take a look at what the extras look like before they say we want this guy or we don't want this guy. And um, I got a part in uh, the generation, the fir first or second generations movie with Patrick Stewart, that crew, mm -hmm. and um, I was working in the med bay as one of the medics and a couple of scenes. And then I went back for another audition at the start for the pilot of Voyager, which is a show I was on for seven years. And um, they cast me as the first officer of the rebel ship, the Maquis ship. And so I was, I was my first day on the shoot. I was working, it was three contracted actors in May and that was it. And I was working right from the beginning. So now once the Maquis all joined the, the Voyager crew, uh, they had, had to feature me quite prominently. And back then I was a little better looking. So I guess I had a little bit of a following. And um, okay, it's just- hold on, hold on. <laughs> all right, wait a minute. I, I'm looking at, at a you know 60 year old guy here who looks like he could have been an actor, but it turns out you are a heartthrob. So I, I want to know a little bit more about how, you know, that look you had and did you have all the groupies falling all over you? I mean, what was it like being a, a pretty good looking actor? Um, well, I still get fan mail, um, you know, usually autograph requests and things like that. You know, uh, oftentimes they don't have a photograph. So I've always provided that stuff for free. Not to every single person, but, you know, and I still get once or twice a year at the high school. Somebody can't get in touch with me. They can't find me because I don't do social media. Um, oh, but they'll Google me or something and find out about Oak Park High School. And I'll go to the lacrosse mailbox in the athletic office and there'll be a letter there, you know, please. And I... I put it, put those aside and let them get, you know, four or five, six of them. And then I will send them out if I have something, but you know, all these years later, I don't, I don't have that much. <laughs> to be uh, I will tell you, if people go Google this guy, cause I did, and you were a very handsome young man and I'm sure you have plenty, <laughs> plenty of fans and not that you're not good looking now, but you know, it's sort of a different stage in life. So, exactly. so Tarek, you know, just, you know, before we close with a book on the acting thing, I'd like to know, and I know our audience would like to know, any interesting actors or actresses you ran across, let's go with that, and any interesting incidents that occurred on camera, off camera, and then we'll get to the steamy love scenes, but just interesting actors or actresses that you might have well, come across. One of the best, inter most interesting experiences I had was I was an extra on Nixon with Anthony Hopkins. And interestingly enough, Robert Beltran, who was, uh, you know, I said I was the first officer of the Maquis ship. Robert Beltran was cast as the commander of the Maquis ship. I didn't know, no, we didn't work together on Nixon the same day or anything like that. 
but we later found out we were both in the same movie. And um, <clears throat> anyway, so we, we were doing, do you remember those public square type things when Nixon was running for office? You know, they would have like, Wait, you're asking me if I remember when Nixon was running for office? I do. How old do you think I am? No, actually, I do, I do too, but I doubt much of our audience does, so you're going to have to really explain that. Well, you've got to remember there were three channels of TV, and if, if somebody was running for office and they were on TV, it was on all three channels. So okay. we, we had to watch or do nothing. So, um, but, uh, you know, it was basically it was a stage, and they had the curtains pulled, so it looked like a, a, the, the set that Nixon would have been doing his uh, staged public uh, public square meeting. And uh, Anthony Hopkins playing Nixon, he, for one reason, he selected a couple of people in his mind, I know this as an actor, that he would talk to, you know, throughout the, the, uh, the speech he was giving. And I was one of those people and we kind of made eye contact, but anyway, we broke for lunch. Oliver Stone directed this. And we, we broke for lunch. And we're walk, I'm walking off the set and there's, there's this tiny little opening, probably about 150 people in the room. So we all are bottlenecking. And standing to my right is Anthony Hopkins, who everybody was calling Tony. And I, I without thinking about it, it just came out. I looked and there's Anthony Hopkins standing next to me. And I go, Sir Anthony. <laughs> Well, he must have loved that because then an American recognized he was knighted. Mm -hmm. And he, we started talking as we're waiting to get out of the room. We were now heading to the lunch line. And, you know, he's an A-list star. So he's standing in the lunch line with me. And these PAs are coming up to him and saying, Tony, Tony, come to the front of the line. And he just looked and he said, no, I'm, I'm quite happy here. And he waited in line with me and amidst all the extras. We got our lunch, we sat down, James Woods joined us. And uh, I think a lot of people must have been wondering who the hell is this guy <laughs> eating lunch with Anthony Hopkins and James Woods? <laughs> oh, so, awesome. yeah. And is Anthony Hopkins a good guy? He doesn't like eat with his hands or anything like that, right? I mean, he's polite? No, the, he is, I mean, he is such a gentleman. He's such a generous person. I, you know, I haven't, obviously we didn't stay in touch or anything, but I, you know, he's one of my favorites. I watch him. I read a, when it's, there's an article about him or an interview, I'll read it. He is just so down to earth. He is not about celebrity and fame. He's about the, the work. He's about acting, which, you know, uh, you just have to respect that. You know, you know, it's kind of like the way, the way I coach. It's not about winning and losing. It's about playing to the best that we can as a group. It's it's almost like uh, I almost approach it like it's an art form. And, you know, we have we want to put we want to create art while we're doing it. We have, you know, at, the, at our level, we have our moments. But, you know, it's not like we can put it together for 48 minutes without interruption. Yeah, so you just provided the perfect segue. I don't even have to do it. Um, let's talk a little bit about lacrosse. I mean, you mentioned four years playing at Cornell, doing face-offs as a freshman, so clearly you had a pretty good career there. Talk about a little bit about what you would attribute your own success in lacrosse to and how you coach uh, players today and, and try to contribute to their success. Well, the first thing that comes to mind as far as my success was I never missed a game to injury. Uh, I never missed a practice uh, to anything. Uh, well, actually, that's not true. I did have to. Well, we'll go back to that. I attended every practice, but if if I was not injured, I was I was on the field, and it wasn't that. Oh, I'm obligated to. It was, that was I wanted to do that. I I the day without lacrosse is like a day without sunshine for me or football. You know, swim practice, if it was up to me, I would have missed a few of those. <laughs> I kind of like the team sports a little better. <laughs> so that's number one is, you know, and you know, in college, we had 29 incoming recruited freshmen my freshman year. 
every single one of them were all league, all county, all American, captain of their team. I was not, I wasn't even captain of my team. And now as a coach, I look back and I see why I wasn't. Uh, I was, I was a little selfish as a lacrosse, as an athlete in high school. So I totally get that. Uh, at the time I didn't, but years later, you know, we get wisdom with age, you know, there's a trade-off. I lose my looks. I get a little wiser. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, but so I'm like, tra yeah, translate that into your players. I mean, you know, what, what are you, what are you teaching your players? What's your mantra? What's your philosophy as far as we have one of our pillars, you know, our, our core value pillars is team teammate self in that sequence. Um, we don't always get everybody to buy into it, but by the time they graduate, they've heard that a lot. And that's stolen from the US Navy ship shipmate self because if our ship goes down we all go down mm -hmm. um so and if you're looking out for your if we all know that my teammates are looking out for me i can focus on looking out for them not i don't have to worry about protecting myself and you know there's personality types there's upbringing there's there's all kinds of reasons why kids don't necessarily buy into that right away but if you want to have success at Oak Park, on some level, you have to buy into that basic premise, team, teammate, self. Well, and honestly, we're not going to have, you know, we're a small school, small public school. We're not going to have the best athletes on the field every game. We're not going to have the most skilled lacrosse players on the field every game. Uh, you can't get bigger, stronger, faster in a week and a half or a month or two months you but you, that happens gradually but what you can do is be smarter you can un, not so much understand the right plays but understand what are the wrong plays and avoid them um and again we reward effort over result you know if if you are if you're putting in the effort in practice you will get in the game if you're putting in the effort in games you will continue to play it's the kids that aren't, uh, and we don't have a lot of them. We've got some really good kids at Oak Park, uh, and they're usually all pretty bright. Um, and if they, you know, so that's, if we have any success, it's because of what we do together and how we, well, we work together. As soon as we get into hero ball, uh, we struggle as a team because we, you know, we're not going to put a pretty much every game we play. We're never going to be able to ha have a guy that it doesn't matter who, what you do against him. You can't stop him. We don't have that guy. <laughs> so um, were, you, were you that guy in college? I mean, you know, uh, were, you know like, whether it was face offs, ground balls, whatever. I mean, were you a, a real force or were you sort of, you know, part of the team and, and a complimentary part. That's, you know, as a coach now, I'm going to say every complimentary part is that guy. Because if you're, if you're the designated shooter, you're not going to get that shot unless everybody else is do, picking up the ground balls, playing defense, um, you know, pushing the ball up the field, passing ahead moving the ball, moving off ball, all those things. You know, if, if we've got a brilliant Dodger right here with the ball and three guys are all standing in here with their defensemen, who's, how's he going to succeed? So uh, was I that guy? I was, uh, we, I played, I was a face-off guy, which got me on the field as a freshman. I didn't get on the field a lot but it got me on the field as a starter, as a sophomore. Um, the face-off guy couldn't run off the field back then. It was because they didn't want specialists. Mm -hmm. And I kind of agree with that to this day. Um, so because they couldn't run off the field, I had, I had some physical gifts and my coach, Richie Moran, was kind of forced to teach me how to play lacrosse because- He was uh, stuck with you, you were on the field. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, he, 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 it's like, if we want, we got to make this guy better, which means smarter. Um, what I did in high school was 
compared to college, the slides come so slowly in high school. I could absorb hits and hold on to the ball. So I, I beat my guy, and more often than not, I let my defenseman beat himself. You know, it's like if you if you can be a little cagey about it, you bait a defenseman. Most of them in high school are going to try and take the cheese out of the trap, spring the trap. Here comes a slide, absorb the impact, go through that, absorb the impact, go through the next slide, and then take the shot. Uh, in college, the first time I got into a scrimmage freshman year, I tried to play like I did in high school. I rolled, I was up top. I turned my back to the defense, which is a mistake. I rolled back, turned. It was like a team photo. Three guys just ran me over. <laughs> I was like, okay, don't do that again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we are going to be out of time here shortly. I, oh, no. I don't know. I don't know if there was a story there. You were about to unload a few minutes ago that you said we'll get to that later. But um, here's your chance to just. Uh, it's, it's the lightning round. Is there anything you want to get out there that uh, might be worth hearing? Well, we didn't get a chance to talk about my animals. Well, let's talk about your animals. I'm glad you reminded <laughs> me of that. So here's the deal. I mentioned at the top of the show. I did say animal whisperer. Let's see who you're whispering at. Well. Um... I guess the, I'll start with the big one. That's my buddy, Nova. Okay, so I can see that clearly. If someone's listening, what are you showing me a picture of right now? That's a black, a close-up picture of the face of a black bear. And, and he kind of adopted me one day when I was barbecuing in the backyard. And he strolled into the bed. This is back in Connecticut. And he strolled into the backyard and... I have been feeding squirrels since out here in California, you know, uh, because one day I found a baby squirrel that I thought was a rat. Long story short, realized it was still alive. Uh, didn't know what to do with it. Started feeding him formula that I mixed through an eyedropper. The squirrel, he grew into a, a squirrel. He was running around my apartment here, climbing up in the curtains. Uh, and everybody was telling us, you got to set him free. You got to set him free. Well, I could have just opened the door because this was his home. He would have come back every night when it was bedtime. I didn't do that. I sent, I gave him away to a, a squirrel rehabilitator. When I was back East with the whole COVID thing, I started feeding the squirrels, you know, on the patio in the backyard and putting out food for them. And, uh, that attracted raccoons and then possums at night and the skunks. And so now I'm feeding all these animals at night, the squirrels during the day, the birds. And um, a couple of squirrels, wild squirrels, one in California, one, you know, they kind of, every, they're, they have personalities like people and they're, they're more comfortable or less comfortable around a human. Well, the one here in California, she would literally like crawl over my arm to get to the other side of the balcony. She'd come into the apartment, but, um, you know, I could pet her, but I never picked her up. And anyway, so I had a raccoon adopt me last summer. Unfortunately, I think he didn't make it because he, he stopped coming. That, that was Wilbur. And, uh, we used to play hide and seek in the backyard. Well, anyway, so back to Nova. So I'm barbecuing. I just put this beautiful steak on the grill and this bear walks into the backyard. Now we'd had a bear come in and I thought it was the same bear. And he walked down into the yard away from the patio. So I was thinking, okay, I'm, I want to take this steak off the grill. I was about to go inside, but okay. And then he seemed pretty cool in the backyard. All of a sudden I turned around to look and he was walking slowly up towards the patio. And, and I thought to myself, oh no. And there was a, off to the, this side, the grill was over here. There was a little pile of sunflower seeds from the squirrels. He got up to the patio, he looked at me, I looked at him. He kind of walked around the, the table in the patio, sat down on the other side and started eating the seeds. <laughs> oh. I was just trying to sear the steak and then my wife was going to finish it in the oven. So I got to the point where I thought it was seared and I went inside and uh, the bear didn't bother me. I didn't bother the bear. Well, he came back a few more times over the wait, summer. Wait, let me back up a second. So that steak at the time was seared, right? Not completely cooked. 
Correct. He didn't send it back to the kitchen and ask for you to cook it a little bit more. <laughs> Bears, well, I've done some research. Bears eat surprisingly very little meat. They, they don't, they generally will only kill if they are starving. Um, and he was more interested in the sunflower seeds than the meat. All right. So, um, you know, for the raccoons and, and the skunks now, I put out dog kibble at night as well. And if a bear ever shows up, they, they ignore the kibble. So they, they get their protein through insects, which is good to know. If they find a carcass, they may eat it, but they're not going to kill because they run the risk of injury and there are no hospitals in, in the wild. So bear doesn't want to get injured. All right, so uh, just to bring us to the very present, did you tell me you're uh, uh, auditioning for parts and the acting is still going on even oh, today? Oh, right. Interestingly enough, Garrett Wong, who played Lieutenant Kim on Star Trek Voyager, he contacted me a couple months ago when I was back east, maybe four months ago, and he, he's doing a podcast with Robbie McNeil, who played Lieutenant Paris on, on Voyager, and they wanted to interview me you know, because he thought the fans would be interested and they do the, sh they watch an episode and then they talk about their memories of that episode and what they liked, didn't like, et cetera. And that's so, and then they do some interviews. So they interviewed me. Well, Robbie couldn't make it. He had a, a personal emergency, but I, I talked with Garrett for an hour or so. And uh, he asked me if I did conventions and I said, I haven't done any. So interestingly enough, my, neighbor here we're passing in the garage the other day a week ago and he says i met this gal who does star trek conventions as an agent uh i, I know you did star trek do you want to you want me to give you her number get her do you want me to give her your number i said absolutely so emily contacted me just three or four days ago and uh, we talked for a while and it sounds really interesting. And I've, I've always, you know, from all the Star Trek people I worked with who do conventions, uh, they all say it's great. So uh, we're gonna look into going to, back to Star Trek conventions. Well, okay, so, so would you be Lieutenant Ayala in those conventions? Well, or would you be a, a, my, would you be a Klingon or what, what would you be? Well, I've played Klingons, I've played Herogen, I've played a lot of aliens, I played an unnamed alien assassin, I actually killed Lieutenant Kim one episode. Um, but uh, yeah, I would probably be Lieutenant Ayala, Ayala, but I am fairly famous for Satan's Robot too. And uh, so much so that this guy in Canada con DM'd me through Twitter, and he wanted to, uh, he asked me if I was interested in a 3D print out of Satan's robot. And I swear to he made he made this for me and sent it to me. It looks perfect, except miniature. <laughs> I'm like, wow, Don Einerson. So hey, sifting back through each of our acquaintances, turns out we have a mutual friend. Um, I went to <laughs> high school with Scott Bakula, who went on to do Quantum Leap and a bunch of work with Star Trek. Turns out you know him too. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, Scotty was the captain on Enterprise and Star Trek Enterprise, and which is the show following Voyager. Um, I was, they took place 400 years apart. So I was uh, too recognizable from Enterprise, from Voyager to work on Enterprise. So I didn't work the whole first season, <clears throat> excuse me. And Jerry Fleck was the assistant director on Voyager as well as on Enterprise. And they were in a production meeting. They were doing a shoot on a desert planet uh, where the, the, the culture of this planet was they play this game that was very similar to lacrosse. Jerry knew about my background in lacrosse. He called me up, asked me if I would be interested in being the technical advisor slash coordinator for the gameplay in this episode. Well, I of course agreed. I went in, we had a production meeting, found out what, what they were looking for. and. Uh, the shoot was to take place in Calexico, um, where they have sand dunes and things like that. So we, we had to go down there for three days, and I had to teach um, the two, two uh, I'm trying to think, oh my God, I'm blanking on his name, but Scotty and 
the first uh, first officer how to look like they were playing lacrosse. And we, originally, and I had to teach the extras how to how to look like they were playing lacrosse. So I did that the first day, uh, first night, and then uh, I had to choreograph the gameplay. And I guess I impressed enough people. I also put myself in the background. They had me in costume, so I was in the background uh, just to add some a little more authenticity. Um, and so I basically got to teach Scotty how to play lacrosse wow. and or look like he played lacrosse. And the thing is, he's a really good athlete. And he he looked like he had been playing. You know, we didn't have a real ball. It was all C the ball was CGI, but he looked like he'd been playing the game his whole life. So kudos to him. Well, I tell you what, um, it's sort of something comparable. My son, Zach, who played lacrosse, you know him. Um, it has pursued a career in modeling and commercial acting and has done a lot. He's never made it onto a, a Star Trek episode, but he did a, he, he got into a commercial where he was playing soccer. He got into a commercial where he was doing backflips and stuff. He got a casting call for a commercial for lacrosse and didn't get the part. And the guy who was directing it said, you're not doing it right. And he's like, oh. and so it just shows you that it's good to know that <laughs> Keith Scotty was doing because Zach couldn't even get a lacrosse commercial. And that's what he had played for, you know, 10 years. So. Wow. I, I remember auditioning for a movie years ago that was um, Mystery Alaska, where they're playing hockey and this hockey team plays the New York Rangers. And because they have this hockey cl cl culture club up in, in Alaska, Burt Reynolds was in it, uh, Russell Crowe. I saw it. I remember yeah. the movie. Yeah. Well, myself and a bunch of my hockey playing buddies who were actors auditioned for the movie None of none, one of them, one of them got cast as a goalie, and yeah. that was it. And yeah. and the act, the people that got the part didn't play hockey. Yeah, well, Zach <laughs> rac rationalizes. He goes, "Dad, they weren't looking for authenticity; they were looking for whatever the commercial needed." And I said, "Well, I still don't get it, but what do I?" Yeah, know? yeah. But I mean, that's that's unfortunately or fortunately not uncommon. Yeah. yeah, and you know, with camera angles and such, you can make anything look pretty pretty good yeah yeah all right so last question for you i'm going to make you choose between lacrosse and acting if you got a choice between doing a hot love scene with j-lo or jennifer aniston or whoever the more current girls are or winning a cif championship in lacrosse now think about this hard because you know this is you're going to go to your grave thinking about one of these two things what do you take <laughs> Well, love scenes are not all they're cracked up to be. <laughs> so that's not really a, a hard decision. Okay. I was Raquel Welch's bodyguard for a night, though. No that, kidding. Yeah, that was that was she's a sweet woman, too. Well, that's um, a lot of body to guard. I'll, I will tell you that. I'm sure that, that I, accident, that I accidentally trying to protect her. I don't think I've washed his hand since. I see. You got a little, right got a little grab me. there, huh? Nice. <laughs> nice. Uh, okay, well, so what if it's CIF championship or Academy Acting Award? What do you take? Oh, wow. That's tough. Um, that's, that's, that's tough. 20 years ago, I probably would have said the, the Oscar. Uh -huh. Today, I might say CIF. All right. That's good to know where your heart lies. I'm sure your, your players yeah. are glad to hear that. Yeah. That would be the only be again because we're such a small school, and for us to accomplish that, it would mean that we we did create that forty eight minutes of art, <laughs> which uh, is so elusive. All right. Well, listen. If you're a lacrosse fan, you're gonna you know remember Tarek Ergen. If you are a Star Trekky, you can contact the show through laxrats.net and try to find out where Lieutenant Al Yala may be coming to a convention center near you. <laughs> Tarek, thanks for joining us, brother. Let's get out of here, all right? You're very welcome, Chopper. Thanks for the conversation. It was fun.